Well, good morning, everyone. Hey, we're back again. Welcome to the Rolla Bible Baptist Church online version of our church service for November 29th. Man, where has November gone? I just can't believe we're already at the end of the month. It seems like uh, the months are going faster and faster every every year. <clears throat> we're glad you're able to join us today. I uh, would just encourage you uh, to leave a comment. Uh, let us know you're, you're with us there. And also, if you have a prayer request, you can leave that as well. Uh, we do look at those and we uh, write those down and uh, they're added to the prayer chain each week and um, your prayer requests will get prayed for. So just be encouraged with that. <clears throat> I just have one announcement uh, this week. Um, we found out um, from Connie Patterson this week that there will be no Bethlehem night again for the second year in a row. It's too bad. Um, we were uh, looking forward to be able, perhaps being able to do something there again this year, but uh, apparently it's not going to happen. So just be aware of that and uh, we just keep praying that uh, numbers will go down and things will open up again before Christmas and uh, that we'll be able to have a bit of a normal Christmas this year. So anyway, glad you could join us and I uh, trust that today's uh, service will be an encouragement to you. And uh, let's uh, let's just open our time in prayer and commit our, our time to the Lord. Father in heaven, I thank you today that we can gather virtually like this and that we can uh, worship you no matter where we are, uh, whether we're in our homes or whether we're in our vehicles, whether we're working, whether we're uh, just uh, relaxing at home. And uh, just thank you, God, for the opportunity we have to to be in your word today. And we just thank you for your word. We thank you that it encourages us each, each and every time we open it up. And we pray for that encouragement today. We just ask a blessing on our time together. Thank you for uh, the contributions that have come in this week. And and we just pray that uh, you would use these items just to encourage people and to uh, draw them to yourself. Uh, we just commit our time and uh, into your hand, God, and uh, just uh, use this time for your purposes. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Okay, uh, I'm going to play a song here. And... Uh, Trust that it'll encourage your heart as you uh, as you listen to this song. The song is called "What a What a Beautiful Name," and of course that uh, that name is Jesus. So uh, enjoy this and think about our our Savior as you listen to this song today.
Well, thanks guys for that song. That was, uh, that was that's a powerful song. I really enjoyed that. Thanks for sending that in. Um, it's very encouraging. We also have a, a testimony from Charlotte Miller today. She came over and recorded this uh, ahead of time, and uh, so we have that. It, it's a little testimony about uh, what's been going on in her life in the last little while. So um, we're going to hear from Charlotte right now. Well, good morning, everybody. It's been a little while since I have uh, done one of these, and this is a little different than um, some of the other stories that I have written. It's called, Oh No, What's Wrong? Something was not right in my chest, and I couldn't determine what it was, but something was not right. You know, sin can do that to our spiritual hearts. When I saw my doctor, he said I needed a pacemaker, something to make my heart beat better and faster. I had presented to him with a pulse of 34 to 39, not good. I had an electrical problem. In the hospital one night, it dropped to 24 to 26, not good. I slept through the whole episode until I could be transferred out to get the pacemaker. I had to stay close to medical help. Finally, four days later, I was transferred to Prince George, and two days after that, I received my pacemaker. What a difference there was! I could breathe without puffing and being short of breath. I was so happy to be able to do what I wanted, when I wanted, not wondering if I was going to be able to breathe. I came home the next day on our Northern Health bus. You know, at age 11, I gave my spiritual heart to the Lord. Now, 67 years later, I get a new electrical charge for my physical heart. I was now firing on all four cylinders, giving me more energy and a new lease on life. You know, that's what happens when God gives us a new spiritual heart. We see things differently and people differently. This pacemaker will eventually give out and the battery's good for 10 years or so. Now the Lord may come before the 10 years are up and I won't need it anymore, or the Lord may choose that my natural heart will give out and the pacemaker won't be able to keep it going any longer and I will die and I'll be with the Lord. And I may have to have the battery replaced, who knows? Any one of those possibilities, I have something great to look forward to. And I'm excited to see what is ahead. But the main thing is, is your spiritual heart under God's control. Now listen to this one. My physical heart has been beating over 242,689,200 times in my 78 years. Now that's if my calculations are correct. How many times has my spiritual heart beaten? as I have shared my Lord and Master, and how many more times could it have done so if I had obeyed the promptings of my Lord and Master? One thing I found myself doing while in the hospital was praying for the patients and I, as I saw them coming in to emerge, and I was also praying for the staff as they were treating them. I counted that a privilege, and it did something for me in here. I realized that with, with some encouragement from friends that I was there at that specific time for a specific reason. God's timing is always perfect. I could encourage the staff, have fun with them, and be a patient that had a cheerful outlook for them. As we allow the Lord our spiritual heart, it's amazing what will happen. Even though the physical heart grows older 
and weaker, the spiritual heart never grows old. Sometimes it may grow cold to the Lord, and we must watch that that doesn't happen. We need to stay close to our Lord and Master and allow His surgery to take place. You know, I wouldn't have traded this experience for anything, and I trust that I have learned something from it. And if there's anybody out there listening to this little short episode, and you haven't given your heart to the Lord, consider doing so. It is awesome. God bless you. Well, thank you so much, Charlotte, for that testimony. What a what a powerful testimony that is about God's protection in your life and how He took care of you during during that time and how He's given you a new lease on life. And thank you too for that message about uh, those of us that know Christ as our Savior. We've also been given a new heart and and uh, we can enjoy the prospect of eternal life, a heart that's going to live forever. So thanks, Charlotte. I very much appreciate that. Let's uh, let's spend a little bit of time in prayer here. Um, there's always lots to pray about, isn't there? There's lots of stuff going on this week and this since last Sunday, since we were together. And um, it seems like there's disasters and tragedies around the world every week that... Um, come about and uh, we need to be uh, vigilant and praying for people that that need God's care and and protection uh, lots of flooding in BC and lot, many people displaced from their homes and um, some loss of life and uh, loss of uh, livelihood for many people and uh, so we're gonna pray for that today uh, there was a mining disaster in Siberia this week uh, a large explosion underground I guess and and 50 some people died in that uh, as a result of that there's just think about of that there's there's probably 50 families or so that are that are grieving and missing loved ones today so we'll pray for them as well pray for our governments We're going to pray for those that are sick and those that have recovered as well so join me let's let's pray right now father in heaven i thank you that we can come to you again as a as the body of Christ and unite our hearts in prayer. Thank you that you hear our prayers, that you answer our prayers, and that you're always, always uh, available to us. And uh, God, uh, we don't deserve it, and yet you've uh, told us in your word that you delight in, in the prayers of your people. So God, we we pray that you would hear us today and that you'd uh, respond in uh, according to your will and in, in all of these things that we're praying about we praise you for who you are who you are and for your word and for your character which we've been looking at god your your mercy your grace in our lives we just thank you we we thank you for those that have recovered from sickness recently and we just continue to pray for many that are still sick and still struggling hanging on to life and we just pray that your hand your healing touch would would uh, be involved in in these lives and that you'd heal according to your will that you'd give strength that you'd give encouragement and draw people to yourself as a result of their illness and uh, we just uh, recognize we're so uh, helpless as far as our health is concerned and and so we just trust you to take care of us in in all of these things we, we pray for these flood victims in BC, God. We just pray for the families that have have lost uh, their livelihood and may, perhaps some have lost uh, loved ones even. And so we just pray that your, your hand would be in their lives, that you'd be drawing them to yourself, that you'd be encouraging them, and uh, that you would uh, just accomplish all you desire through this disaster. We think of these miners and their families in Siberia, God, and we just pray for your comfort in their lives, that you would draw near to them and that you would draw people to yourself even through this disaster. And God, there's many other things around the world that we could be praying about that uh, that has affected many people and none of them are outside of your control. Pray for our governments again, God, around the world that uh, these men and women that are making decisions and 
leading our countries would uh, would be looking to you, that they would be praying, that they would be hearing from you and making decisions based on on your your wisdom and your direction, and not just listening to their own their own thinking or listening to the lies of Satan. <clears throat> God, we thank you for our church again, and we pray for each one as we're uh, somewhat isolated these days and not able to uh, gather as we would like. God, I pray that you would just uh, encourage each one, each heart, each one that's feeling alone, and you just uh, help them through through these days. And I just pray that uh, as your word goes out today, that it would fall on ears that would hear and hearts that would be res responsive and receptive to you. We just pray these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. Okay, we are back to <laughs> another message on the character of God. Um, I had not at all intended to spend this much time uh, in this series talking about the, the attributes of God, but, you know, as as I studied this out, it seemed like every time I, I would study an attribute of God, I, there would be another one that would come to my attention that uh, I just felt like uh, you know, I, I got to talk about that too because that's important and it's exciting to know what our God is like. And uh, so today we're going to talk about the faithfulness of God. This this may be the last one, but uh, I make no promises. Uh, so we'll see where we go from here. So today I want to talk about the faithfulness of God and it's the very foundation of our faith. The faithfulness of God. If God is not faithful, then why would we believe in him? Why would we trust in him? Why would we even have any hope that the Bible is true if God is not faithful? If we, if he's not faithful, then we're, we're just a bunch of idiots. We're just a bunch of foolish people putting our, our faith in something that is not right, something that is not true. But we don't have to worry about that, do we? We don't have to worry about the fact that God is not faithful. Um, he's already... Uh, his word tells us to begin with that he is faithful and he has proved in through history that he is faithful that he does what he says he's going to do and uh, many of the things that he has put in his word and is in the Bible have already come to pass and we can trust and believe that the things that are still uh, yet to come to pass will because God is faithful uh, we're gonna we're gonna spend some time in the book of Lamentations today, okay? So if you have a Bible, you might want to pull it out. Um, we'll have some verses on the screen there, but uh, because we're we're gonna be looking at the third chapter of Lamentations, it might be good if you had your Bible open and uh, you could just read along with me in whatever version you happen to have. I have the New King James out uh, here today. And this was written uh, by the prophet Jeremiah. This book follows the the, the book of Jeremiah. And uh, God spoke to Jeremiah and, and... First verse I want to look at, and you'll, you'll notice that this is recognizable from last week. It says here in uh, verse 22 and 23 of... Uh, of Lamentations 3 through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not they are new every morning great is your faithfulness those are those are just wonderful verses uh, we have a song written uh, from this verse great is thy faithfulness I didn't have a uh, recording of that this morning for you, but I would have loved to have that. Um, but great is your faithfulness, is what the Bible says. And and we talked about, last week we talked about the mercies of God being new every morning. That also comes from this verse, as you can see there. Um, so, God's mercies are great, His faithfulness is great. And to really understand the context in which 
Jeremiah wrote these verses, we we got to go back to the beginning of this chapter. Um, Jeremiah is in distress. Jeremiah is not a happy camper at this point. The prophecies of Jeremiah have been fulfilled. And if you read the book of Jeremiah, you'll understand um, that uh, he prophesied that there was judgment, great judgment coming to to Israel and Judah. The, the Babylonians were going to come and take them away. If they did not to return to the Lord, if they did not um, turn back to God, but continued on in their rebellion, that the Babylonians were going to come and they were going to devastate Jerusalem. They were going to take away, take away the people to Babylon and they would be displaced. And those things had happened. Those things had taken place just as God said they were going to take place. Things were bad and Jeremiah himself was suffering. Let's read some of those verses and you'll you'll get the picture here about the desperation in in Jeremiah's life. He says, I am a man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has led me and made me walk in darkness and not in light. Surely he has turned his hand against me time and time again throughout the day. Here's, here's a man that is suffering. He's, he's hurting. And he knows this. He knows this much. He, he is suffering at the hand of God. He knew that God was behind all these things that had happened. God has led him to walk in darkness. Now, sometimes we think that, that God would never do that. God would never lead us into, into a dark place. But Jeremiah says that the, the reason for his suffering was God. God had led him here. It seems like to him that God has nothing good for him in these days. Let's, let's read on a little bit more. He has hedged me in so that I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy. Even when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. Wow. J Jeremiah isn't, isn't suffering because of personal sin in his life. The oppression was because of... Um, because of the sin of rebellion of Israel, by the nation of Israel, it was the oppression. It was the oppression that had been predicted by God, but predicted by Jeremiah in his, in his, um, in his prophecies, and God was carrying it out. <clears throat> Jeremiah knew that. He knew that. He knew exactly why he was going through this, and yet he still cries out to God, and he gets no reply. An interesting. It's interesting that the the title of the book, Lamentations, the, the word lamentation means loud cries. And here we see Jeremiah crying out loudly to God for some relief, some, some answer to his prayers. And yet, um, the way he words it here, he says, God shuts out my prayers. God shuts out my prayers. Let's go on to the next verse. And he said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. <clears throat> it seems like utter despair has set in for Jeremiah. His strength is gone. He even feels that uh, any hope in the eyes of the Lord that the Lord might have for him is, is, is gone. He, seems, he sounds like, like a man who's just at the end of his rope here. Like a man who has nothing left. Here he is. Think of it, though. Uh, Jeremiah was a prophet of God. He was picked by God to, to be a prophet of God. He was a man who served God. And yet, he, uh, who you would think would be a spiritual giant, has sunk to this level of despair. You know, life can throw things at you and me and and to where we get in a situation where we, uh, we're in a similar place as Jeremiah. Um, so many things out of our own control, so many things that um, discourage us because they've happened and we really had nothing, no control over them. It could be a failed relationship, one where you've done everything in your power to make that relationship work and yet it has failed. Maybe, maybe it's your health. Maybe uh, 
you've lived well, you've eaten well, you've taken care of yourself in hopes that you'd stay healthy, and yet the diagnosis comes. You've got some something that is totally out of your control, and you have no, no way of um, being free from it. Maybe you've been faithfully working and saving and caring for your family, and, and then suddenly one day your job is gone. The bottom falls out of the economy, and you're struggling now, and you just don't know if you're going to be able to make ends meet. This is another thing that's out of our control, isn't it? Or it could be maybe one of your kids has gone off the rails. They've turned their back on what they know to be true, and now they're walking... Uh, away from God, they're walking on a path toward disaster. You know, any of these things, and there's a myriad of other things that could cause you to feel defeated and desperate, just as, just as Jeremiah was. You pray and you pray and you pray and you pray, and yet you hear no answer from God. It seems like he shuts out your prayer, just as Jeremiah said. He shuts out my prayer. How are you going to find encouragement? How are you going to find hope in a situation like that? What can you do? Well, we're going to read on here in this chapter and find out how Jeremiah encouraged himself in the midst of this great despair that he was in. Let's look at verse 21. Well, I think we'll look at verse 21. There we go. He says this, this I, I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. And he's talking about, he's, he's now um, telling you the next things that I, that I say here I'm, are coming to mind. And that gives me hope. He begins to think about some things. He brings, brings to remembrance some things that he knew. He went back to the truths that he knew about the character of God. Did, did you get that? Jeremiah is going to go back and talk about the character of God, things that he knows are true about his God. And that is going to encourage his heart. It's going to give him hope. And that brings us to the verses that we started off with. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions they fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. He recalled the mercy of God. Jeremiah recalled the mercy of God. He said the reason the reason there was still an Israel, the reason there was still a Judah, uh, was because of God's mercies. He remembered that God's compassion, God's uh, empathy for them would not fail. He would always be a merciful and compassionate God. He remembered that God always does what he says he will do. His faithfulness is great. And because of the great faithfulness of God, Jeremiah decided that he was going to wait patiently. He was going to wait patiently for God to act. <clears throat> Look at verse 24 to 26. He says, The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should hope and quietly and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Do you, do you hear what Jeremiah is saying there? Jeremiah realized that God was being faithful. He was being faithful to do what he said he was going to do. He was faithful to bring judgment to Israel. Because he said that's what was going to happen. He said, you continue on in your rebellion, there's going to be judgment. And it's going to come. And God was faithful to bring judgment to Israel. He describes that in Deuteronomy chapter 28. You can, you can go and, and read that chapter uh, when we're done here. Go read Deuteronomy chapter 28. But you know what? Jeremiah also knew that God would not stop there. That he would also be faithful to bring about the restoration of Israel, which he talked about in Deuteronomy chapter 30. So, 
Jeremiah is realizing that the faithfulness of God not only brought the judgment, but it would also bring restoration, and it gave him some hope. <clears throat> if he was faithful in one, he would also be faithful in the other. We find some principles here in this uh, in this chapter that Jeremiah lays out about about affliction and about trouble. I'm going to use the word affliction here uh, regarding the trouble that was that had come upon Israel, the trouble that had come upon Jeremiah, the trouble that comes upon you and me. And there's different reasons for affliction, but there's some principles here that I think I think can help us to endure these trials, these afflictions that come to us. Um, and they can and there's some principles here that can help to give us hope and help to uh, allow us to see God uh, faithful even in even in times of great trouble. All of these principles sit on this this foundation of God's unchanging faithfulness. That's our that's our topic today. Remember, don't don't lose sight of that as we talk about troubles. So the first principle is this. Affliction should be endured with hope in God's salvation. All of our inflict all of our affliction should be I guess seen through this grid of uh salvation we have salvation in god verse 26 it is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the lord waiting is hard isn't it sometimes waiting is the hardest thing because we just want the affliction to be over we want we want the trouble to be done and yet it isn't done it continues on and and yet we know that our earthly troubles, we know that the pain and the suffering, these are only for a short time in the whole scheme of things. You, you compare the amount of time that we're, we live on this planet even uh, in relation to eternity, which lasts forever. It's just a short time. It's just a, just a, just a blink of an eye. No matter how bad it gets, no matter how dark the way, remember, he says, remember the hope of your salvation. You're in a dark place now, but you're going to have an eternity in, in the bright, glorious presence of the Lord. God has a glorious future in store for you, free of trouble and trials, free of sorrow and pain, free of any burden. There will be no burdens in heaven, people. Think of that. Everything we go through should be endured with the hope of our salvation in focus. So no matter what you're going through today, no matter what, if I've described some of your troubles today, um, as you look at those, keep your salvation in focus. That's the first principle that Jeremiah lays out here. Second one is this. Affliction is only temporary and tempered by God's compassion and love. And Jeremiah tells us this in verse 31 and 32. For the Lord will not cast off forever. It's temporary. The Lord will not cast off forever. Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. God is a compassionate God. God is a merciful God. We've already looked at the mercies of God. They are new every morning. These things that we endure, these trials, these afflictions that we're going through, they're doing a work in us to conform us to Christ. They're refining us as the fire refines the silver, as, as the um, silver refinery heats up the, the crucible um, to purify that silver. That's, that's, what we're, what's, that's what's happening with us as we, as we go through these trials and tribulations and, and these troubles here on earth. They're, they're creating a purity in us that could never be achieved in any other way unless they unless they're the heat of the trial the purity does not will not happen and remember remember the refiner as he makes that fire he he never makes it too hot he never keeps it going too long he tempers it with love and compassion think of think of the lord 
as or think of God as as the great refiner and he is refining you and me through these trials and troubles that we're we're going going through he is he is a God of merciful character and he tempers these trials with compassion and love second Corinthians 4 17 I don't have this on the screen but uh, Paul wrote this for our light affliction he calls it light affliction. Sometimes it doesn't seem light to us, does it? It seems like it's it's heavy and it's hard to bear. He says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So even Paul, in, in his letter to the Corinthians, he says, it, it's, it's, a, it's affliction, and uh, he makes it sound like it's light. It may seem heavy to you, it, he makes it sound like it's but for a moment. It may seem like a long time to you. And yet, in relation to glory, he says there's something far greater being done in our lives that, that we need to be aware of and we need to keep sight of. God is using this in your life right now to refine you, to bring you closer to that person that he wants you to be. Principle number three, God does not delight in affliction. God does not delight in affliction. Verse 33 says, for he does not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. Jeremiah knew that this judgment, this judgment that came upon Israel and Judah, it, it brought no pleasure to God. It wasn't making God happy to to allow these things to happen. Just just as you as a parent, you and me as parent, and when we discipline our children, it, it doesn't bring any delight to a parent to, to discipline their children. The affliction of Israel was a step to bring about their reconciliation. It was a step to bring them back to himself. It would be outside of God's character to delight in bringing pain and suffering to his people. It would be outside of his character to do that. Did God take great delight in sending Jesus to the cross? No, I don't think so. He did it out of his love for mankind, his love for you and me. He sacrificed his own son. It brought no delight to him. But he did it out of love for, for you and me. He was faithful to the promise that he had made, that he would defeat sin and Satan. Fourth principle, affliction is always in relation to God's sovereignty. And we see the verses here, 37 and 38, and from Lamentations 3. Who is he who speaks and it comes to pass, when the Lord has, when the Lord has not commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that woe and well-being proceed? Jer Jeremiah reminds us that all affliction, anything that happens... Everything, everything that happens, it's never outside of God's sovereignty. It's never outside of God's control, ability to, to understand and deal with. When God speaks, he says it comes to pass. And it's from the mouth of God that both judgment and reconciliation come. Jeremiah knew that. And it should be comforting for you in whatever trial you're going through right now, that your trouble is not outside of God's control. It's not beyond the realm of, of God's ability to deal with. God has a purpose in everything that he does. God is amazingly um, knowledgeable. He knows all things and he has a purpose in all the things he does. So that trial that you're in right now, he's got a purpose in that. He's got a purpose in that for you. And it's not outside of his control. <clears throat> Fifth principle here, affliction ultimately came because of Israel's sins. In, in regards to what Jeremiah was going through, um, Jeremiah knew that um, it, it was because of Israel's sins. It was because of their disobedience, their rebellion to God that they were going through this. Verse 39, why should a living man complain? A man for the punishment of his sins. Jeremiah knew exactly why Israel was being judged because of their rebellion to God. It was clear to him 
it was it was his whole message in the whole book of Jeremiah. And if you want to read about a a doomsday message, read the book of Jeremiah because that's what he had. He had bad news for for Israel and for Judah, and and he was known as the prophet of doom. And he wasn't popular. He nobody liked Jeremiah when he'd come around because his his message was negative. But it was the message that God was sending to them. Our trials, the things that we go through, may, may not be the result of sin in our life. But listen, we should never be so arrogant as we, that we would not be willing to take a look at our own heart and see whether, whether or not indeed we are the cause of our own trouble. Jeremiah reminds us of this, that we are all sinners and we deserve punishment. We deserve punishment. He says, look, look at what he says in that verse. He says, why should a living man complain? He says, you're living. God has not destroyed you. We are, we are all sinners. We, why should we complain about the adversity that comes into our life? Are we not sinners deserving death? Yeah, we are. All of us deserve death. And yet, why should a living man complain, he says, a man for the punishment of his sins? He has not punished us for our sins, has he? God has not put the punishment for our sins on us. He, in his mercy and his grace, he laid all of that on Jesus. He kind of, I don't know, it's sobering to think that we complain when really God's mercy and grace are evident in our lives. <clears throat> last principle here principle number six affliction should accomplish the greater good of turning God's people back to him as already said there's a purpose there's a purpose for everything that God does Lamentations 3 verse 40 let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord that's God's purpose that's God's purpose for Israel the judgment came because he wanted them to return to him. He wanted them to be faithful to him instead of being rebellious to him. God's discipline is always with one goal in mind, to turn people back to himself. Our trials are designed to refine us and conform us into the image of Christ. It's a good practice for us to look inward and confess the sin that we find there. It's a good practice to keep short accounts with God. It's not going to guarantee that we have an easy life by any means, but it will lessen the uh, possibility of our, our trials and our troubles being caused by sin in our life. So we've been talking about the faithfulness of God. So what is the expectation of God for us as his people and in regards to faithfulness well the faithfulness of God is unchanging we we know that God's never going to be unfaithful it doesn't change even if we are not faithful look at what it says in 2nd Timothy 2 13 if we are faithless if we turn our back on our faith he remains faithful he cannot deny himself what a wonderful text is. God's faithfulness does not depend on you and me. He desires us to be faithful. He wants us to be faithful, but it doesn't change his faithfulness if we're not. He cannot deny himself. He cannot turn his back on things that he has said and, and not do them. That's not the God that we, we understand him to be. He will not renege on anything he has said. How reassuring that is for us to know when we fail again and again and again we struggle and struggle with sin we we are not faithful to walk as we should we can know that God will continue to be faithful even when we're not especially when we're weak in our struggle against sin this is a verse I use often and I I believe that we should have it at the tip of our tongue all the time. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us 
our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what God is looking. That's what he wants us to do with this sin, this repetitive sin that we can't get rid of. We can't seem to ever get victory over. He wants us to confess it. And look what it says. He's faithful. He's faithful and he's just and he will forgive us. He said he will and he will. And he will give us uh, a clean slate. He will cleanse you and give you a clean slate. God's desire is always reconciliation. And he is always faithful. Part of the fruit of the Spirit uh, is faithfulness. You know, we have the Spirit of God within us and, and he's at work and he wants to do something in our lives. He wants to conform us to the image of Christ and and part of that conforming process is to produce faithfulness in us. It's what we are to become. Faithful not only to God, but also to our fellow man. Is there some reward for faithfulness? Well, look what it says in James 1.12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, or blessed is the man who is faithful... For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. We are blessed when we are faithful. God approves the ones who confess their sin and trust in him for salvation. A crown of life is for those who are faithful in trusting God. Listen, if you want to be approved by God, begin to believe in him and begin to trust him. Believe in his word. Believe in what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. That is how you gain God's approval. There's no other way to, to gain approval from God. There's no other way to attain this crown of life, which is described here in James chapter 1. <clears throat> There's one more verse here I'll share here before I end. It says this in Hebrews eleven six. 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. The, re the reward for those who diligently seek God and believe that he is, the reward is eternal life. Eternal life in heaven with God. It's the greatest gift that has ever been offered to mankind. It supersedes all the earthly treasures that we so often chase after. These great seven-figure salaries, the multi-million dollar mansions, all these things, the, all the pleasures of this world, do not even hold a candle to what God has offered us in the gift of salvation. All of those things are going to burn. They're all going to be left behind. That, that fortune that you're chasing after, you can't take it with you. It will mean nothing when you stand before your Savior. Or God, the righteous judge, depending on what you do with him right now. Most important decision you'll ever make in life is to decide what you're going to believe about Jesus Christ. You may think you've got big decisions in front of you. Maybe there was big decisions you've made in your life already. And you look back and say, wow, it's the biggest decision I've ever made. You know what? There's only one decision which tops the list, and that's what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? What are you going to say when you stand before him on the judgment day when he asks, did you believe in my son? Did you believe in Jesus Christ? You want to be able to say, yes, Lord, I believe and I've been approved by you. Uh, I've been accepted by you. I have faith in you, and you are pleased with that. Only by believing in him and his death on the cross can we find that approval by God and have that hope of a future, that hope of eternity with him. He will not reject you. He will not turn his back on you uh, when you come to him with an open heart like that. He is faithful to his word. He is, he is faithful to judge those who turn their back on him, and he is faithful to save those who come openly to him and confess their sin and believe that Jesus paid for their sin. 
So let's close off in a word of prayer and then we'll have one more song. Father in heaven, I thank you that you are a faithful God, that nothing I can do, nothing anyone can do, nothing any government can do, any power on this earth can do to change that. We can be as faithless as ever, and yet your faithfulness is always true. God, I thank you that you will not reject anyone who comes to you with an open heart, with a heart that says, I am a sinner, I need a savior. You will not reject that person. You will not turn your back on them. Thank you, God, that you're all about reconciliation. You're all about bringing people back to yourself. That's why your word was written. That's why your son was sent to this earth. So, God, I pray for every heart that's listening, every ear that hears this message today, that today would be that day of salvation if it, if it hasn't happened already. God, and I pray for everyone that's going through struggles and troubles. I pray that they might look at these principles laid out by Jeremiah and be able to find some hope and some, some joy in the fact that you are faithful, God. Your mercies are new every morning. God, just encourage our hearts as we wait patiently for you to act in our lives. And I thank you for your love and for your care. And just ask a blessing on the rest of our day today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, we have a, a closing song here um, today. We'll listen to that and then I'll come back for just a moment after that. All through this world, through this world, sadly I, sadly I roam. I have but one goal. I have but one goal. To make heaven my home. Make heaven my home. Not by my not by my works, but by His but by His grace. Shall I look, praise God upon His face? Because of because of him, I'll be up, I'll be up there. Because of because of him, his glory I'll share. I'll share. I'll never give never up. give up. Oh, my way grows my dear. way grows dear. I'll make it through. Praise God. Down on my down on my knees, I made it right. I made it right. He changed my he life. He changed my life from darkness to light. from darkness to light. Now I can now see. Now I can see through shadows so shadows dear. so dear. I'll make it through. Praise God because of He. Because of because of him, I'll be up, I'll be up there. Because of because of him, his glory I'll share. I'll share. I'll never give, never give up. Though my way grows my way grows dear, I'll make it through. Praise God because of because of. Well, thank you to the men that sang that song. Um, it's just a reminder that our faith, everything that we believe in, uh, everything that gives us hope and encouragement is all because of him. It's all because of our Lord Jesus Christ and his, uh, his faithfulness to us. And uh, I pray that as you go into this week, that you'd be encouraged and that you'd uh, find um, the Lord give, giving you strength for all that you face and all that you're going through and that there'd be joy and there'd be peace in your hearts too. So look forward to talking to you again next week. Have a wonderful week and God bless you in the meantime.